where we have seven speakers and then at the end there will be questions for the panel and um, some discussion. Also at the end we'll have the uh, World Food Prize Laureate, Dr. Hardy Brewers, who will give a brief introduction as he takes up the chair of the Micronutrient Forum. Um, any, of the, any of you who were lucky enough to be at the Micronutrient Forum meeting in um, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia a couple of years ago um, will know that we started this process of eye to eye in, intervention to implementation process using iron in a series of, of steps. And one of the outcomes of that is the um, IUNS task force, um, which is tomorrow at 8 a.m., um, looking at um, some of the benefits, the exact wording, um, the programmatic implications from risk-benefit analysis of iron interventions in young children. So similarly, we hope the discussion today on um, uh, integration to implementation of vitamin A, which is at a critical time in terms of public health nutrition and evolving, um, we hope that will also lead to some um, uh, applied and useful outcomes similarly. So I'd like to go straight into the, the speakers. I'll, of course, they're all well known. Um, I'll just use, uh, give their names and their affiliations. Um, and they're all very strict, they've assured me, on term, in terms of time. Um, so on behalf of uh, Dan Wright Wrighton, um, uh, with his co-author Homero, uh, Dr. Homero Martinez, who's the uh, Senior Technical Advisor to the Micronutrient Forum, we'll look at the, in, introduce the scope of the problem and an overview of the controversy and how the eye to eye approach will be applied. Dan Wrighton, who is somewhat the, um, the intellectual heft behind a lot of this, um, is with the National Institutes of Child Health um, Development uh, from the National Institutes of Health of the USA. Thank you, Amel. Thank you. So, uh, just start by saying that none of the authors uh, have any conflict uh, who will disclose today in this presentation. We'll uh, be right into our but I try to write the interventions. Uh, the first thing that, that I want to say is that it, 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 it is not a, an easy issue when you're trying to understand what the interventions do and what to do about the interventions. If it was just a matter of saying we're giving too little or we should be uh, careful not to give too much, that would make it so much easier. But actually, we have to think about what happens when we have all the extremes either under nutrition, uh, malnutrition because of overconsumption, the nutrition transition playing its role on top of infectious diseases. Now we are overwhelming crisis of, of uh, non communicable diseases, the ever present role of the microbiome and inflammation and in how it shapes up the different responses. Uh, on top of it, climate and environmental change. And across all of this, the um, <clears throat> early initiation of life and its implications on several diseases later on in, in life. This is not meant for you to read, it's just meant to overwhelm you. This is just uh, an, an initial uh, list of the things that go on in that we have to harmonize to properly address our interventions and to try to make sense out of them. So, we really need a comprehensive approach. We have to focus on health uh, outcomes, both including the individual clinical assessment, as well as the population in terms of program monitoring and evaluation. We have to consider diet and nutrition, uh, trying to build up from evidence-based interventions, understand even more the role of food systems, and as I mentioned before, the environment taking into consideration not only climate change, but social, behavioral, and health systems, uh, the, co the context. So with all this as a background, what is I to I? Uh, we have crafted the idea of uh, the inter interventions or implementation to effective implementation as a model meant to harmonize different efforts. On one hand, we're trying to respond to different controversies that may arise as a result of experience, of new knowledge, or of changing conditions on the ground. 
uh, Ian has just mentioned with the case of iron, and I will illustrate it later on in my presentation. And we're not going to focus on vitamin A along this presentation. We plan to create, implement, and sustain evidence informed, safe and efficacious interventions, policies, risk to standards of care, and to fully integrate nutrition into all, all aspects of health prevention, disease pre health promotion, disease prevention, and treatment. One of the key drivers of this whole concept is that diet is not just, uh, or, sorry, diet exposure is not just the first step in achieving a healthy nutritional status. Nutrition is both a biological variable that serves as an input how much to eat and as an outcome. What are the biological biomarkers that we'd like to use as uh, to reflect status? Uh, the idea would be to use I try to translate research findings to evidence informs programs and policies in a process. I'd like to step, uh, just to emphasize the process that involves connections at multiple states, uh, stages, uh, and we need basically to foster in lines of communication. So I2I is meant as a platform to foster integration of all these different aspects that I've been just alluding to. Initially, we conceptualized the integration and implementation along a bridging concept that is the tagline of the Micronutrient Forum, bridging discovery and delivery. And we'd like, like to move from biology and assessment to consider interventions, to think of the implications for program rollout and scale up, and to uh, engage different stakeholders to effectively deliver the interventions. Uh, but the, the, this concept has been evolving. So while we still understand there is the need of a continuum of effort needed that will link basic biomedical, clinical, plant, and animal science research uh, that go through knowledge translation to eventually lead to interventions, which may be sustainable both culturally and biologically, uh, and that uh, may focus on nutrition-sensitive and nutrition-specific interventions. The need to roll out or to scale up uh, interventions is often a, a, a big driver of what science produces on a smaller scale on controlled trials. So when we actually move to policies, programs, country level, or even global policies, and there is a shift in the paradigm, this is when we think that I2I can become important. Monitoring and evaluation certainly provide uh, both timely and appropriate, the, the realization for timely and appropriate change. Uh, we need enough data to feedback on how to probably move ahead. And basically, it's important for this critical, critical interconnecting in a continuous loop that I will illustrate in a couple of slides ahead. So, initially, as uh, Ian mentioned, uh, the concept of I2I was developed in our global conference held in Ethiopia in uh, 2014. At that time, we decided to focus on iron as the approach, and we had several issues. What do we know, what do we need to know about iron biology to explain efficacy and safety concerns that were much prevalent at the time after the international community realized that a blanket approach to give iron supplementation to all children who may or may not need it especially in the context of um, uh, infectious diseases, in this case malaria, could actually have unintended consequences and actually increase the risk instead of uh, providing the benefits that we were expecting. So the implications and concerns regarding the efficacy and safety for programs and country experiences that have uh, rolled out these interventions uh, or were in the process of rolling out different iron interventions was what triggered the idea to uh, foster this dialogue and propose the uh, I2I approach. Uh, at the time of the Ethiopia Global Conference, there were four tracks, so the whole meeting, uh, the meeting was organized in four tracks, and uh, throughout the four tracks, different aspects that I have just illustrated on previous slides were approached. Eventually, all this was tied up with recommendations that came out uh, on a peer review paper that you can see listed there. Uh, 
um, one of the things that we learned as we developed the concept is that it's not just a linear continuum. It's actually a feedback loop. Things happen at different stages, and things feed back to each other in a more dialectic fashion, shall I say. So, as we have now evolved to try to understand a little bit more the different inputs that may shape, shape up an intervention, considering the different pieces that I've uh, illustrated on, on, on the previous week. So, what we try to do now uh, during this IMS meeting is to take eye to eye a step further and to move from the initial example of IMS implementation and now focus on vitamin A interventions. We are introducing the concept uh, not of uh, vitamin A adequacy but insufficiency because this is what triggers part of the biological responses that we are concerned about. So very briefly, let me just uh, briefly state, and this will come up uh, at different aspects throughout the presentation. What is the problem? You know the global vitamin A situation has, um, has been summarized by the World Health Organization. We have different indicators of the uh, magnitude of the problem. Uh, we take night blindness as one of the indicators, or serum retinol. We can see that there are several million uh, preschool-aged children, women, and other individuals affected, although these are the target populations uh, of most interest. Uh, of course, we have different prudent approaches to deal with the vitamin A, uh, to, uh, on how to improve vitamin A status. Uh, the preferred approach is to go with a uh, uh, balanced diet, improving availability and intake of vitamin A, both through nutrition education, trying to take advantage of those vitamin A rich foods available in the community, as well as to improve better access to these vitamin A rich foods. Of course, we have the most important interventions of fortification, and now even more, uh, taking more preponderance in different countries in the world of biofortification. Uh, supplementation has always been seen as an, an intervention that can complement the other two approaches when the populations uh, have not reached enough vitamin A sufficiency by the previous approaches. And there are several recommendations about how to give supplements and, of course, the importance of controlling infections and parasitic diseases will also improve vitamin A status. Uh, we have some um, agreement, I guess, uh, around the vitamin A supplementation. Uh, currently evolving from WHO guidelines, um, and we have demonstrated, it has been demonstrated through, through several uh, carefully controlled studies out in the literature, the importance of this intervention uh, to improve survival, in, especially in children under five. We realized that and there has been a significant reduction in under five mortality in hybrid countries and that their vitamin A efficiency has become, I would say, rare. It is still existent, it is still important, it is still clinically relevant, but its uh, prevalence has diminished. Uh, GABA has, uh, the Global Alliance for Vitamin A has, uh, Alliance has uh, recommended uh, to scale back supplementation with vitamin uh, A efficiency is no longer a public health issue meaning that it has less of a 5% prevalence at a population level. So I, I think that so far we agree on this uh, concept. However, there is some controversy related to vitamin A interventions. A few years back, uh, the late Professor Latham uh, triggered part of our steering of uh, international opinion about the role of vitamin A programs. Uh, Mason, Reimer, and co uh, further steer the part questioning the relevance or the importance of the um, up-to-date interventions that uh, have been described. Uh, this, the large DEFTA trial uh, carried out in India that basically showed no impact of this intervention in mortality in children also steered much of the international opinion. And these papers and others trigger different uh, responses from uh, different groups trying to assess safety, evaluation, uh, issues related to the previous uh, papers. 
So the objective of this symposium is not to question whether vitamin A has had an effect or an impact on child's mortality. I think there's enough evidence out in the literature to support that intervention. What we're trying to do in this symposium is to highlight the need for a comprehensive approach to address vitamin A insufficiency. We will try to consider different aspects, including the biology, clinical and population assessment, uh, the role of different interventions, and how these different interventions can be translated to appropriate programs and policies. We hope to hear from two countries which have uh, considered these different situations and who have taken decisions on their approach to control vitamin A deficiency. And we will hope that this will foster a dialogue both within the broader international community as well as within the audience present with us. So with this, Mr. Turner, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very nice uh, introduction and setting up the process for today and the problem and the issues. Um, Meryl. The next speaker will be Professor Sherry Tanmunajo uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, and she will be addressing and giving some more background as we discuss the problem on the biological evidence for and against high dose supplementation. Thank you, Sherry. Vitamin A deficiency. 
So the interim, which has continued for several decades, is to give high-dose supplements. So this is a study that we did in Indonesia many years ago, and half of these children got a vitamin A supplement. But as you can see, serum retinol did not change. However, if we look at what happened in the liver, this is the modified relative dose response, there was a significant decrease in the MRVR response, meaning that liver reserves were in fact replete. Uh, this is a study that we did in Zambia, and it shows that again, serum retinol did not change during the intervention. When we looked at the MRDR response, however, what we discovered is both groups of children lost liver stores over the course of our trial. Well, these children actually received a high dose here. So you can see that all the children were vitamin A replete at the beginning of the study. They were still vitamin A replete, but had lost liver stores after the administration of that high dose. In this study in Indonesia, we had two groups of children. So when did they get the supplement? Well, the first group got the supplement here before the first intervention, and the second group got the supplement here. And so you can see one month later, they both had normal stores. Serum retinol did not change in these interventions. So let's move on to animals. So many human studies were done before there was any biological evidence that was done in animals with these high doses. So one of our studies looked at giving the doses to the lactating sows, and so we had two high doses, equivalent 200,000 and 400,000 to the lactating sow. And then we looked at the nursing piglets, and we had an early kill date at three days and a longer kill date at 18 days. So what we found is that either if we looked at it early or late, those whose mothers got the low dose actually had better liver reserves. And in fact, liver reserves were lost in response to the high dose supplements. When we looked at serum retinol, even though the early kill piglets had lower liver reserves, they actually had higher serum retinol concentrations. We did another study where we looked at piglets, and these piglets were given a variety of doses, 0, 25 KIU, 50 KIU, and 100 KIU. In the first parity, the piglets had better vitamin A status than in the second parity. And basically what we see here is the 50K and the 100K were able to prevent vitamin A deficiency in the first parity, but not in the second parity, the more vitamin A depleted piglets. But liver reserves were only 5% higher with the, with the higher dose of 100K. And again, there were no differences in serum retinol among any of these piglets. However, when we looked at the modified relative dose response numbers in these studies, Basically, the MRDR was three times higher in the more vitamin A depleted parodies than in the, the more vitamin A adequate parity. This was followed by studies that were done looking at evaluating the doses that were at one time recommended at birth, 50K IU. So we had male and female newborn piglets over 300 piglets that were dosed orally with 0, 25, 50, and 200K. And blood was drawn at a variety of times. And then we collected um, various organs. So basically what we encountered was more was not necessarily better. All the organs came down to normalcy at 96 hours, but we had increased catabolism in the high dose group. So what we don't know is, was this due to the 200,000 KIU dose, or was it because the piglets hit this magical number of 0.7 micromoles per gram liver, which in the 1990s was called excessive vitamin A. But one interesting thing to see is that the piglets who were on the placebo grew better. And this was irregardless of the dose of vitamin A that had been given at birth. 
Serum retinol was the same by 96 hours, and also they went through two absorptions. So not all of the dose was absorbed within a small time frame. It was absorbed twice during a 24-hour period. The retention of these doses was not very good. In fact, the 200K IE dose was absorbed much, much less efficiently than the 25K, the 50, and the 50K IE doses. And as I said before, much of the 200K dose was excreted in the feces. So this particular growth finding is not limited only to piglets. So basically what we have, um, we did a study in monkeys. So these particular monkeys were on four different treatments. One of those treatments was high dose um, beta carotene. All of these monkeys, we're in monkeys now, all of these monkeys were receiving vitamin A in their feet. And at the end of the study, we, the monkeys were all killed and their body weight was negatively impacted by their vitamin A status. And so when you look at just a GLM analysis, it's 0 .001, when even, but even when you account for the treatment group that they were on, even though it was beta carotene, we remained significant at 0 0.02. So maintaining balance or else. We don't want to go back to signs of zero ophthalmia. We want to maintain a healthy serum retinol to fight infection. But we need to look at balance. And we know that catabolism increases. With these high doses, we see increased serum retinol esters and osteoporosis risk with high doses. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, a lot to digest there, but it helps to give the biological perspective of where we're going. The next speaker um, was the well-known uh, Dr. Emon Don Kesmali, uh, Senior Nutritional Advisor from Mahidol University in Thailand. He'll be talking to the relative strengths and weaknesses of available interventions, program strategies, um, that prevent or improve vitamin A status, both in individuals and populations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. So, <coughs> I'm, um, well, first of all, I do kind of conflict of interest on this, and um, I want to go into following Sherry on the uh, biology of vitamin A into what are we seeing primarily on the landscape of vitamin A intervention? And so I'm going to uh, underline uh, five points. The relevance of high dose vitamin A supplementation has been questioned. The systematic reviews and meta analysis on vitamin A supplementation, the prevalence so far that we see, and the global and regional trend. What are the profile of those vitamin A interventions? Who's doing what and where? And the data gaps that are needed for policy decision. As uh, Homero has outlined, the relevance of vitamin A supplementation has been questioned. And Dr. Mason and his group pointed out a few things. First, that we are seeing a slower trend of vitamin A deficiency in comparison to other micronutrient intervention, which is iodine deficiency disorders. And uh, the other thing that has been worked on has, is the effects of vitamin A capsules on the shy vitality. And that over the years we are seeing a larger effect, and now what he's pointing is that the Delta Tri, which is uh, involved over one million children in India, has shown no impact on mortality. There's a lot of papers that came out, I have to say, after this is published, 
to, sh to share that there has been certain limitation on the depth of trial. But the point still holds that we need to take a look at some of the things. And uh, what has been striking has been that in the early years, the reduction of child mortality is highest during the first two months. And after that, it seems to stall both boys and girls. And that has been pointed out as three issues where policy needs to be reviewed and probably a shift from vitamin A supplementation to others. Now, what he has been referring to has also meant a systematic review and meta-analysis that was done a little earlier that shows that on a total basis of the trial so far, we are seeing about 24% still reduction of vitamin A supplementation or post mortality. What would happen if you add the Delta trial? A lot of people have been wondering, if you add the Delta trial, that effect size was cut by half, just because of sheer number and the percentage weight to this Delta trial is 65% of the whole total. Yet, the 12% child mortality reduction is not something to ignore. That has been one of the bases uh, that the WHO still recommend. On a potential that if you want to sustain vitamin A status and other intervention come to play. One of the evidence that I think we have seen in earlier years, and it strikes me from the beginning, has been the study that was done by uh, a Dr. Ramatula in India. What she has shown is that the frequent smaller dose of vitamin A supplementation is the most effective. It has the highest impact, 54% reduction. I still remember when she presented that. It was really striking. The rationale for her to do so, she said, is because it can be translated later to food-based strategies. But from a public health feasibility trial, that is very difficult. Yet, it is something we have to think about, and that will come up later. Now, the global debate on vitamin A supplementation, as a matter of fact, has, a, has an advantage that all of a sudden, we start to take a look again at what happens to vitamin A deficiency, what happens to the whole picture of global and regional landscape. From the trend from 1991 to 2013, the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency measured by ozone retinol reduced from 39% to 29%. However, when you take a look at the regional trend, it's declined the most in East, Southeast Asia and Oceania. What is striking is the highest prevalence in these under five children are still quite high in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And the main thing about this has to do with what then happened to the child deaths that can be attributed and the paper that came out in 2015, take a look at that and found that the child deaths attributed to vitamin A deficiency has declined to 1.7% overall, but more than 95% of those deaths occur in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. It, the debate then go into vitamin A supplementation, if needed, need to take a look at this evidence and then zoom in. So you're going to hear some of the things from country. But it has to really go follow where the evidence is, is to focus better in the regional where that is still a problem. When we come into those data, a lot of people say, where has that data been taken? Well, the two thirds of those countries with vitamin A supplementation, the data is more than 10 years old. And so lots of things come in, and that has been the latest work that has been done, is to take a look then, some of these countries not only implement 
five minutes of meditation. They go into others intervention. Out of the 82 countries that has five minutes of meditation, they have 51 parallel program with either fortification of oil sugar margarine leaf flour or biofortification or micronutrient powder, where some of them has more than one intervention. Out of that 51, 27 countries has no or all vitamin A efficiency data. So that is really something striking to call for and up to date for a decision making of where you should place the intervention. The recommendation from the group has been to assess vitamin A status under the micronutrient survey to be done every 10 years. Now one more review on this is to assess vitamin A status is for what? It meant for program monitoring evaluation, as you may have already heard. Vitamin A supplementation alone will not be able to sustain the status biology. The body keep it in balance. It's a check and balance. So you have to parallel it with something else. Well, those that require for adequacy, happy sure diet survey is needed, particularly taking a look at the lean season and where the infectious disease burden. So you spot it. If it's a worst case scenario, that is the inadequacy marker. For those that have more than one intervention, the coverage of intervention should contribute to different a combination of vitamin A intake. And this is where we need to monitor for excess. The validation with biochemical markers, even though serum retinol is not so good, as you may have heard what Shirley has said, but the distribution at population level may give you an indication. Other surrogate, like retinol binding protein or breast milk retinol, has been considered as potential. The retinal ester or retinal isotope dilution of tracer techniques to identify excess stores on a subgroup population may be helpful to guide the program and policy as to when you say when and how to do better. So all in all, the vitamin A program assessment guideline is still needed to guide the country. The, my last slide. And I think that from vitamin A supplementation to the intervention to eliminate vitamin A, improvement is better to sustain through dietary intake of food-based foods. To supplement or not to supplement, GABA consultation has already suggested to uh, measure the supplemental vitamin A less than 5%. And that would form a basis as to whether you think your population has already reached that level where you can phase out vitamin A supplementation. The gap for, evidence gap for policy decision is really required for up-to-date prevalence to monitor coverage and intake and verify by many workers. So with that, um, I finish my presentation and then this will, you will hear more into where country is doing in terms of that experience. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Emon. Um, very nice from the global picture down to the regional picture down to the country. And now we have two examples from countries that have um, existing active vitamin A prevention, pro vitamin A deficiency programs. Um, and the first one um, will be given by Dr. Carolina Martinez on behalf of herself, Dr. Dr. Ines Mazariegos, and Paul Melga from INCAP in Nagua in Central America. Good morning. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for having me here. Although originally my colleague Torines Mazariegos was presented due to personal issue, it was impossible to her to attend. She asked me to apologize to you all and I will 
present to you the information on Guatemala's successful fight against vitamin A deficiency. I have no conflict of interest to report in relation to this presentation. Guatemala is a Central American country considered low to middle income country with chronic undernutrition is highly prevalent and almost half of our children are stunted with deal with a heavy burden of double malnutrition, with half of our women of reproductive age being overweight or obese. Our diet pattern is monotonous, staple based, with low intake of animal origin products, fruits and vegetables. The staple base with a low intake of animal origin fruits. It raises quantity of processed products such as salt, snacks, and sweetened beverages. Still, even with these considerable challenges to face the nation, vitamin A deficiency in Guatemala populations has been controlled. And it has been eliminated as a public health problem or mostly to the national program of sugar fortification with vitamin A. I will go through the some aspects that can explain this success and how to the A form has been proven sustainable over the time. Combating vitamin A deficiency in Guatemala is a successful history of a long term joint efforts that are not attributable one man, although for a few of them have made significant difference in the process. Under Dr. Guillermo Rojave's leadership in the mid 60s, team for national based biochemical assess the magnitude of the problem. With INCA and other partners experienced technological development allowed to design an implementation of food fortification program where sugar was selected as a good fortification vehicle to target the need of all the population. <coughs> Longitudinal evaluation demonstrate the effectiveness of fortification and campaign enforced to take the problem to political acceptance led to national laws with the coordination of sectors such as government, private sectors, industrial producers, academia, consumers and NGOs. The program has attained sustainability and evidence-based decisions have been taken. Monitoring and surveillance have also been, been key elements to explain the success of those vitamin A deficiency as shown in the next slide. After the first national assessment of vitamin A status show that the vitamin A deficiency was highly prevalent. The program was evaluated, put in place, law was enforced, program launched, was abandoned, was relaunched in 1985. Vitamin A deficiency was already reduced by half in 1995. Since 2010, the deficiency has least to be a public health problem. This maintained successful will be not possible without a virtuous circle of monitoring, surveillance, and adjustments that it keep in place with the effort of several sectors. And as, as I said before, public, private, academia, consumers. It is only fair to mention that large part of the coordination efforts is made through the National Commission of Fortified Foods on Afford. To sustain and justify actions in Guatemala, evidence-based recommendation really on the viable data on dietary intake, natural plus fortification, monitoring of fortified sugar, but retinal levels and coverage reported supplementation a biochemical surveillance, biomarkers of vitamin A status. Let me go through some aspects of this. 
of the key points to select sugar as vehicle for fortification back in 1965 was that it was widely consumed by adults and children rural and urban areas and among socioeconomic levels. Secondary analysis of National Experimental Survey in 2006 showed that the juicy retinal density estimation of adequacy of the diet by age group is quantified by socioeconomic level of residents. Again, it was estimated that not consider the vitamin A provided by sugar, 31% of non poor adult women and 76% of the lowest socioeconomic level will be at risk at, of inadequacy. The contribution of vitamin A from sugar reduces the risk of inadequacy to virtually none. Direct dietary intake in a target population also allows calculation of intake adequacy, a project with the modest groups of population showed that in need, children and women consume sugar as normal part of their diet, not because it is fortified. And this provides more than 100% of the requirements for the population. This is was also proven at national level in a survey aimed to assess the quality and quantity of the diet of children and the mothers almost all regions of the country was assessed with a 24 hours before questionnaire. The results show that the children older than one year are already covering all the vitamin A requirements and sugar is contributing in almost group with a half of the intake. Over the years, continuous monitoring of the sugar fertilization programs has shown vitamin A is available through the country at acceptable, acceptable average levels. I want your attention in places in red color. That year's sugar was allowed to be fortified in the country prior to its commercialization, entering to the country by the port in the Atlantic and to be fortification in Guatemala City. Draw your conclusions. Both data from the monitoring at the household level and quality control data directly from the baking fortified sites show acceptable levels of vitamin A. The data collected over the time also has a low calculation of the variation of fortifying process which in turn sustain how control and regulation from Ministry of Health or any the average level, minimum and maximum. Level should be a start in the regulation. Work and invest for the sugar producer to achieve just in time, packing, packaging and fortification has made it possible to buy and consume sugar within one month of its fortification. Allowing that the target levels at the fortification have come very close to the average home level of vitamin A. Good coverage, about 8% of samples fortified with retinal levels about 3.4.5 ppm, and good levels of average retinal content about 8 ppm can be obtained from both representative national surveillance system. So, as shows from the data of Silvestu in 2015 and also from small confidence sample. In light of the sufficient information on the good performance of the fortification program as country, we are in urgent need to consider all interventions that are taking in place in Guatemala, in particular supplementation and micronutrient power distribution. Mission that were at the origin recommended as a merging measure should be carefully evaluated. In terms of the efficacy, cost, and useful, considering that the population needs are one can be safe, safely covered by the sugar fortification. Another source of 
vitamin A intake at the emerging newborn carry fortified foods that in Guatemala are mostly cereals and milk. I will share some information on them in the next slides. A study just concluded its field work phase as part of an international project to assess possible vitamin A excess of toxicity as a result of multiple intervention. The Globitas project, under the technical leadership of Dr. George Litz and financed of Belil and Belinda Gates Foundation, an international atomic energy agency, was conducted in Guatemala by Dora Inés and me. As part of the dietary survey to children three to five years old and their mothers, we collected information on the most consumed fortified foods and we had labeled in the statement of the fortification. A limited sample of more commonly reported foods will be taking place and we will then have a real levels of vitamin A content in these foods. Voluntary fortification is taken as a marketing value and we have found products that declare up to 30% of RDI of vitamin A. Supplementation regulation with megadosis of vitamin A adjustment was put in place in order to cover only the younger children under two years. Previously, supplementation aimed to reach children under, under five years. After the second year of age, dietary and biochemical surveillance has proven that dietary play, including sugar, is enough to fulfill the requirements. According to the official data, supplementation is covering 75% of children more than one year old. As you can see in this slide, with data reported by the mothers, also children have been supplemented and receiving micronutrient power, and target is the younger group under two years of age. Finally, I will present data on the chemical indication of vitamin A status. Plasma or serum retinol has been the common market to define vitamin A deficiency at population levels. Many limitations are known for this indicator, but it is agreed the prevalence of more than 20% of retinol levels is good predictor of deficiency of vitamin A in populations. National Micronutrient Survey from 2008 is the last national information of retinol measured directly by HPLC determination in plasma. The prevalence of 0.3% of level below 20 micrograms per deciliter or 0.7 micromolar reflects the adequacy of the diet. When corrected by inflammation, the deficiency drops to none. When the uh, new data is now being routinely by correct, collected by national surveillance system, but the biomarker used is retinol binding protein, RBP. In Guatemala data, validation of cutoff point of RBP are still pending because values below cutoff of are scarce and make difficult to a statistical calculation of a new cutoff point. The still RBP values below 0.7 micromolar distribution of the markers and changes when considering inflammation are similar to those observed for direct measure of retinol by HPLC. RBP distribution can give useful information to compare age groups and time traits. These slides only tries to point out the plasma retinol levels to tend to be lower in the younger age groups, but also we have observed inflammation rates are also higher in the youngest. So, careful interpretation by the age groups with different occurrence of inflammation should be considered. As concluding remarks, we can say that the sugar fortification program in Guatemala has been successful and proven a sustainable strategy to eradicate vitamin A deficiency in Guatemala that should be maintained and strengthened. 
the existence of the National Food Fortification Commission has been decisive for the defense, maintain, and the strength of the fortification program. Fortification in Guatemala is a cherry covering vitamin A requirements in most groups, so programs to address micronutrient deficiency are to be considered conjointly to avoid excess in text fortification, supplementation, and micronutrients power. Considering the emerging races of chronic disease and the health concern related to the high sugar consumption, fortification program is meant to be adjusted with increased vitamin A levels to meet requirements with reduced dietary sugar intake. Even if regulation chances are slow, evidence from the surveillance and monitoring should be continuously and guidelines based on evidence will maintain success and also remain in excess as a country resource for monitoring and surveillance are limited alliances have been made to keep them in place and provide continuous information to adjust the program. Some challenges in biochemical markers for vitamin A status are do we have evidence of vitamin metabolism in the younger 6 to 11 months old? How good proxies are repeat to retinol? Here I showed some, not all, of the names of the persons and institutions that have participated in the components of the complex sugar fortification program. And I would like to acknowledge them along with all anonymous efforts of many, many, many people. Thank you very much. I try to resume in 15 minutes a history of problem that has more than 30 years. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Guatemala is certainly been a, uh, just one of the pioneers, I guess, of successful vitamin A programs. Um, from the other side of the world, um, from Zambia, we have Mr. Musonda Mothu of the Zambian Food and Nutrition Commission, who will give a country perspective on the somewhat younger, younger program. This is based on data from 1997 that reported that uh, 65% of the children uh, had vitamin A deficiency and also in 2003 that 53% of the children had vitamin A deficiency. And since then, there has been a supplementation uh, program, a nationwide uh, program, basically targeting children in the age group of uh, 6 to 59 months and this has been done uh, twice in a year uh, which and is complemented by routine um, uh, supplementation through the health service uh, system and uh, consequently at the present moment we the coverages for vitamin A capsule supplementation is around um, 77 percent but when we look at the um, other information from healthy uh, information management system, we see that the coverages are even around 150%. Uh, this is basically due to problems of uh, denominators uh, uh, in the population. And since 1998, the country has also implemented uh, mandatory sugar fortification. So all the sugar that is consumed is actually uh, fortified. And of course, um, a recent analysis uh, last year shows that uh, although the target for fortification, we are targeted uh, 10 milligrams per kilo per, per kg, we see that uh, the variation in the level of uh, fortification is around 0 0.6 to 18 milligrams per, per kg. So we see some, some quality issues there. 
And uh, also in, by 2007, we had uh, started uh, 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 the orange fresh sweet potato and uh, uh, orange maize uh, production. So basically, to increase the, the, the sources of, of vitamin A. And currently, we have a, a plan to even start maize milk fortification. Basically, this is a, a step of food, and we, we plan to do that with multiple micronutrients. Of course, there have been a number of success factors, and uh, uh, firstly, there's been great commitment from the government, as well as the, the cooperating partners with respect to uh, procurement of supplies, as well as funding operations. And uh, at the moment, the, the program, Vitamin A Capital Supplementation Program is fully integrated in the, into the health uh, system. Uh, this is contrary to what used to happen before because initially it was just a standalone program, but currently it is fully integrated. And uh, the other success factor has been that districts now plan for this program, so it is also highly decentralized because then the, the districts are aware of their true needs. And at the same time, we, there is also the use of outreach strategies for those who, are not, who cannot access vitamin A supplements from the health facility. And what, what we've also learned is that social mobilization is quite critical if we are to enhance uh, vitamin A capital supplementation uptake. Quite critical. But we've, there's been quite some, some concerns of, of late, and this is what has even escalated the debate surrounding uh, uh, the, the, the program. Firstly, the World Bank reported that um, the cost uh, per child is around 98 uh, cents. But a recent analysis by the civil society scaling up nutrition has shown that from the national budget, the only allocation is $1.11 a child. And so certainly that has brought in a lot of questions to say, if we are to sustain this program, then certainly we are not allocating adequate resources uh, for nutrition. And, um, and there's been also some reliance on cooperating partners. And we are saying, how can we allocate much more resources from the national budget to support uh, this pro uh, program? So there's been these uh, discussions currently. And the other aspect that we are concerned about, of course, is the weak weakness in the monitoring and evaluation system. As indicated in the introduction, the data that we are using is based on 2003. So that is quite old data. And there is also considerable disparities in the, uh, in the coverages. When you look at the DHS, we are saying it's 77%. But when we also look at the Child Health Week reports, is actually uh, even up to 150%, basically due to denominator uh, uh, problems. And also recently now there's, there's a concern of uh, the risk of excess intake in localized areas. Uh, recent uh, uh, studies uh, conducted by Gannon and others showed that in a particular district, actually we were, there, 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 there was a possibility of excess uh, intake and, we, and our concern is we are not doing enough to put in place a robust monitoring system that routinely collect data to know exactly what the hotspots are and where to concentrate. In addition, there are quite a number of questions that we are asking based on how much is being allocated for nutrition and also uh, the first one is how sustainable financially is the vitamin A capsule supplementation program from the government point of view? What can we do in order to sustain the program? We are also saying, what is the true contribution of the program to morbidity and mortality? And this is with respect to the fact that when we look at the historical perspective to child mortality and morbidity for diarrhea, uh, respiratory tract infections, we don't seem to see much reduction um, in, this, in, in the prevalence rates and also even in the incident rates on these on this condition. And yet, we are all still, uh, the supplementation is quite uh, relatively high. And also, 
we are now asking other questions on how, what are the sort of connections and relationships between the different interventions that we are putting in place, the food-based uh, intervention of fortified foods, fortification, how do they relate and how do they complement one another? Uh, and also, of course, the question of how to control risks of excess uh, uh, intent. And uh, recently, the other question that is being asked is how best can we design and implement an integrated monitoring system that is able to routinely uh, uh, show, uh, collect data and give us an indication of what is happening in terms of consumption, status, across country, and also even in the hotspots of, of the country. So these questions that are being asked have also contributed to the debate um, that was raised a few years ago um, in some published papers. But as a country, there is a belief that this debate with, uh, with, and also the questions that are being asked can stimulate the government and authorities to put in place a roaring national service that measure vitamin A status and intake patterns. And currently there are ongoing discussions um, on the need to undertake a national survey. Just a few days ago, we had a heated meeting where we say, where basically we said there is an urgent need for us to undertake a food consumption and micronutrient status survey that also includes vitamin E assessment, uh, especially that um, we've also already developed um, a protocol uh, with support of, of, of partners. At the same time, there are proposals that perhaps we can integrate vitamin A measurement in other existing surveys, including the 2018 Demographic Health Survey, which is currently under uh, being, being planned. We also believe that uh, the debate that is currently going on can also encourage our government to critically reflect on vitamin A interventions and whether the interventions are reaching the intended uh, target at the right time. But of course, what we know is that this requires data to know exactly who is being reached in what part of the country and also um, uh, how can we, for example, use the same evidence that we generate for advocacy as opposed to basically a, a general advocacy and communication. So there is a strong belief that this debate should be escalated uh, to, uh, to different platforms. That includes policymakers, because we know that when policymakers are involved, then we can allocate much more resources for nutrition, that includes uh, vitamin A as well, as well as to scientists, so that scientists can also look at in much more detail the overlap between the overlap between vitamin A related interventions and as well as even to the civil society and other program uh, managers. There is a belief that if, there, if we strengthen this kind of engagement, perhaps we can try to see how we can proceed with uh, vitamin A uh, related interventions. I thank you. Thank you very much, Musanda. Musanda. Um, I think all the papers so far, and particularly the last two country ones, have uh, made the point how many sectors need to be involved. This is not just a problem of public health nutrition, but many other sectors as well. And, and of course, it is part of the uh, integration to implementation theory. Um, so, and now we're having representatives of uh, some of those different sectors who will give their views on what does, all, it, what does it all mean, what we've heard so far, and how might we as, as a, a group and the other, with the other sectors move an agenda forward to address the existing challenges that are, that are certainly there. Unfortunately, uh, Roland Kupka um, really knows a lot about this area. Um, from UNICEF, was not able to make it. Um, but I am warning um, Lisa Rogers from WHO and Alison Grieg from the GABA that I'll be calling on them for a comment during the discussion. For now, we'll have uh, a perspective from the clinical side um, by Dr. Raminda Sachdev of Emory University and the CDC. And that will be followed by a uh, perspective from the enabling agencies um, by uh, Dr. Klaus Kramer. So I'll introduce 
integrated class. So now, Pami, if you could uh, tell us what role means from the clinical perspective. Sure. <laughs> sure. So thanks, uh, thanks uh, Ian, and thanks for, uh, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I wanted to take a show of hands. How many in the room are clinicians? So a couple. So, so, so I'm taking a perspective from a clinical perspective in that um, you have to have to hear things two or three times for it to sink in. So, so a lot of has already been said, but I'm going to try to kind of summarize what's been said from uh, the clinical perspective. So I'd like to start off with, the, with a clinical case. So imagine yourself as a medical officer, um, you know, maybe in, in Zambia, and you see this two-year-old child who comes um, in uh, and for, uh, with severe acute malnutrition um, and who had been uh, on treatment already with the fortified ready to eat therapeutic food, foods and is having diarrhea and a poor appetite. And just two weeks ago, there was a measles campaign with high-dose vitamin A supplementation that took place in the, in the child's village, right? So you have several interventions happening in the setting. So, so what do you do if you're just a medical officer? Do you administer high-dose vitamin A supplementation and admit to a treatment center? Do you admit for treatment of malnutrition, but you don't administer vitamin A since the child is already getting vitamin A through and so ready to eat food? Or do you provide oral dehydration for the diarrhea and zinc and send the child home? So this is some of the just perspective that you might uh, face when you're a clinician. Um, so I'd like to kind of summarize what we've already talked about with the eye-to-eye -eye approach, which I think is a good process. Um, and so starting off with research, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about assessment of vitamin A. Um, and then to summarize, uh, kind of from a clinical perspective, vitamin A supplementation. And then finally, how can we really better integrate clinical and public health approaches towards monitoring programs? So you've already seen this uh, slide, uh, but uh, just to remind you, about 30% of children globally are vitamin A deficient based on serum retinol concentrations. And that's essentially the, the most current data we have in terms of the global burden of vitamin A deficiency in, in children. And uh, an estimates account that this contributes to 2% of uh, childhood death. But as you also saw this slide as well, there's an issue with the data. So in these same countries where um, we think we have vitamin A deficiency, uh, a majority have no vitamin A deficiency data or data that's old over, over 10 years. So there's definitely a data gap. And so how do we, how can we better assess vitamin A? And I think that's a, a, a big challenge and one that really need to uh, have increased attention. Um, so looking beyond the retinol binding protein, um, retinol that are measured from uh, serum, um, and thinking of more non-invasive approaches that can really measure what vitamin A is supposed to do, for example, looking at the uh, pupillary response and dark adaptation. And so there's some techniques uh, that are being developed now that can be potentially used in the field because essentially that's what we're clinically trying to do with vitamin A is improve uh, function. And another challenge with assessment is something that was already discussed in the, in the Guatemala presentation is this idea of the acute phase response or inflammation, which is an innate response um, we all have uh, either to infection or, or stress or tissue damage. And we get an inflammatory response that causes the liver to produce acute phase proteins. And ones that are commonly measured are C-reactive protein and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. But also, retinol binding protein and retinol are both themselves acute phase proteins. They're negative acute phase proteins. So we know that they go down with, with inflammation. And so this is just another example that uh, what can happen if you ignore inflammation. You're going to really overestimate vitamin A deficiency. So this is a summary from uh, surveys. These are eight uh, country surveys that we uh, compiled in the Brinder project. And in these eight surveys, you can see the unadjusted prevalence of vitamin A deficiency based on retinol binding protein. And based on the WHO cutoffs for severity, um, six out of these eight countries would be set as having severe public health problem. But now if you correct for uh, inflammation in these settings, all these surveys measure both CRP and AGP. And if you apply a correction, now no countries have a severe problem. And in fact, no one even have a moderate problem. So you've virtually eliminated vitamin A deficiency due to inflammation. So the question is, is this a better measure or is it not? And that's um, really you know, the next steps in terms of how can you better assess, um, especially in terms of inflammation. Now you've already heard this too in terms of, let's move on to supplementation then. And from a, from a clinical perspective, um, if you go to the WHO's website, Elena, and I recommend you all, there's an app, and um, you can download the app. There, there are 10 current guidelines um, on, w, on uh, vitamin A in, in different population groups, in, in children and adults, um, those who have HIV, those who do not, those who have respiratory infection, those who have severe acute malnutrition. And we don't go through these guidelines, but just saying that there, there are 
there, there's recommendations out there on, on, on supplementation. But I think we have to also remind ourselves, you know, what is the goal of vitamin supplementation? Um, and I think often that, that gets confused between the clinical perspective and the public health perspective. And so from the clinical perspective, it really is to reduce the clinical entity of um, night blindness, seropthalmia, and, and child mortality. We've talked about the debate of how much of a reduction, but whether you look at the 12% when you add the data study or overall 24%, the, the effects on child mortality. And then also rem remind ourselves that the, the way vitamin A is reducing mortality is really through preventing specific infectious diseases, um, measles, diarrhea. And so maybe if those conditions become less prevalent in a, in a certain population, maybe that effect would be different. And then the whole question of vitamin A nutrition, to me that, that's a separate question and, and really does vitamin A supplementation improve vitamin A nutrition is probably much less likely to do so. And, and this, all this in the setting of where we have a global coverage of vitamin A um, of 70%. Um, and, and that's similar to uh, pneumococcal vaccine. So you know, a three out of four kids globally are getting this intervention. So to kind of wrap up, what does this all mean then in terms of programs? Um, and, and how do we kind of better balance clinical and public health approaches? So, so to me, I, I'd say from a clinical perspective, really focusing on things like prevention and treatment of malnutrition, prevention and treatment of infections, and then individual vitamin A supplementation in those settings. And then to monitor those clinical outcomes, both in terms of effects, uh, beneficial effects, but also toxicity. And then really the public health side of, of uh, vitamin A is uh, our food-based approaches, dietary intake, food fortification, nutrition-sensitive interventions, and more selective vitamin A supplementation. And, and we've talked a lot about monitoring programs, but looking at both, uh, we need more data on both on the deficiency and excess side. So, thanks. Really, what an amazingly disciplined um, series of speakers. Um, we'd now like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Klaus Kramer from Sight and Life and Johns Hopkins University to give the perspective from the enabling agencies about what it all means and what, how we work ahead with the next agenda. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be with you today. I have to uh, this, uh, declare a potential conflict of interest as my organization is primarily funded by the company DSM, the manufacturer of vitamins and minerals. But please also allow me to declare my interest in improving the nutrition of vulnerable population in developing countries. I have been asked to talk about what does it mean for the in, in, enabling the community or the implementing community. That reminded me of the implementation challenge that we had as a, a theme for a Cycle Life magazine three years ago. We have to make many choices for interventions and then we have to make sure that these interventions are creating impact uh, on the long term uh, at scale so that there's a public health effect with it. As uh, my colleagues have already pointed out, we have uh, more than 80 countries that have vitamin A supplementation programs, but these programs, they have to be adequately implemented to create impact on child mortality. But we have the significant differences in the coverage of two doses of vitamin A between these countries, and uh, it may vary between zero, that is not implemented at all, or just 4% in Nicaragua, Nicaragua, or up to 99% or 100% is reported in the UNICEF uh, State of the World Children in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, or Uzbekistan. There's a high variation. And when we want to uh, have impact, then we have to uh, provide the micronutrient intervention to those who are in need. Just to have a reach of the micronutrient intervention is not sufficient to create impact. What we ideally have is an effective coverage, and this is, means that uh, we improve the nutrient status of the population from deficient, if there's a deficiency, to adequate. When we have these interventions like vitamin A supplementation, and we are uh, planning to phase out, then we really have to make sure that we don't replace one poor program and of vitamin A supplementation with very poor effective coverage to another poor program. 
I will share with you a few examples um, where I have been involved, um, for instance, in um, Madagascar, where we uh, worked with Johns Hopkins on a uh, uh, process evaluation of the 40 dome program. And there were many batches of the uh, microtoxin powder as an intervention brought into Madagascar of poor quality. And I'm really questioning whether these programs can deliver and improve the micronutrient status or vitamin A status specifically. But the one advantage of this program was mothers were trying to uh, mitigate the negative order and smell of these products with more varieties of more expensive food. So basically, dietary diversity of the child was improved as a positive outcome. This is a program, and I was questioning that I should show it here, Pami, uh, is a market-based approach in Kenya uh, for micronutrient powders, where we see within th uh, three years a top from 65% use in the last seven days to 22% in the third year. And just one micronutrient powder sachet per week, and there I have to ask whether this is a real uh, effective method to deliver micronutrient powders. We worked many years, 10 years back with World Food Program and UNHCR in Kakuma refugee camp and this was an extremely uh, miserable experience in terms of the implementation with very poor uh, impact on iron status in the population because the product was not accepted. There were rumors about birth control of the product because the communication was not adequately implemented to, to mitigate potential rumors in the communities. So this is, these are three examples I would like to share with you. So now it does move forward. When we have a vitamin A intervention, then we have many different choices and I have just uh, uh, pointed out here a few of them from a fortified complementary food to biofortified uh, cassava or sweet potato through the supplementation. And what we want to see is an improvement in nutrition status, but usually we don't look into what is happening in between. And this is a slide from the Society for Implementation Science in Nutrition, which is taking this area of uh, inputs, activities, outputs, and intermediate outcomes very seriously and wants to better understand them because there are many aspects in between that we are usually not looking into when we are program, when programs are implemented. But we think it's very important to have a very thorough formative phase to analyze what is required for a successful intervention and making the right choices. And here is another slide from the society um, that uh, David Pellet here did modify. And uh, David highlights in this slide that we have to expand really on the research in between and he uh, named it the neglected middle. And I think that's very important to have a real delivery on an uh, in a program to great impact in nutritional status and nutrition, other nutrition outcomes. So, I want to summarize with what the program implementer really needs. We need, as an implementing agency, policies and guidelines that can be implemented and they must be very clear. In the case of vitamin A deficiency, we need regular data from surveillance systems we have to understand what are the trends in vitamin A deficiency. We have to work on the identification of specifically vulnerable groups or pockets to focus our interventions. And we have also to monitor if there are potential excessive intakes from different interventions. And we need more and better appropriate intake indicators, biomarkers of deficiency and excessive exposures. We also need a regular uh, assessment of intake status, coverage of all the different potential interventions from food to supplement and uh, uh, micronutrient powders or lipid-based nutrient supplements and fortified and biofortified foods. We also need innovative survey designs that would allow us to have a very fast uh, answer on the nutrition situation, this would include point of care status assessment. 
And there are uh, uh, developments on uh, coverage toolkits from Gain, for instance, with the uh, FACT toolkit. Then the uh, Live Safe tool has been uh, expanded to micronutrients in work from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and UC Davis. And there are also these modeling tools that uh, Steve Foster and uh, Rainer Ecclestone have developed to optimize the uh, interventions in countries so that we have uh, at the lowest possible cost the best possible interventions that are reaching people and of course are improving their nutrition status. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Klaus. Um, well, that's the last of seven highly informed um, presentations. Um, I, now, it seems that we've, we've heard a lot of successes, a lot of um, remaining challenges, and certainly some gaps. And one of the big challenges seems to be, with so little prevalence data of vitamin A deficiency, um, how do countries know when to trans um, to, when to move their, their programs, maybe away from supplementation, maybe more into dietary interventions, and so on. But before I open the floor, um, actually I, I would like to call on Lisa Rogers from WHO, really to look at that question of this inadequate data, how do we move forward? Great presentations, and we, I really appreciate all the, the perspectives. For the data, I was recently asked, um, when are we going to update the um, estimates for vitamin A deficiency next? And it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, there is less data being collected overall. Um, I've been working really hard at the uh, micronutrients database of um, WHO, so I've been really digging into some of this data. And serum retinol is I would say, on average, less assessed these days, and retinal binding protein is, is being assessed more. And so we considered in our last estimates, do we combine this data? How would we combine it? Um, we couldn't really come up with a good algorithm to, to, to use both types of data, so we only use serum retinal. And then we also have to remember that a lot of the serum retinal data has not been adjusted for inflammation. There's, we don't really have guidance yet on, on how to adjust it, so we're mixing a lot of data that has been adjusted, that hasn't been adjusted, so it's it's really difficult to, to, to come up with new estimates too. And so WHO is working on uh, starting the process to look at updating the indicators of vitamin A status, what indicators to use and when, and what are the cutoffs, making sure that we provide the great evidence. So I think you know countries really should be encouraged to look at their their dietary data, that really is the goal of these programs. We, we want uh, the consumption of foods high in vitamin A to be um, available, to be used, and so really we can't forget about dietary diversity. Realizing that's, that's an ideal and not always successful, we have to think about the other interventions that are available, and I, I'm, I have to just plug one more thing, is that I'm so happy to hear everybody talking about, let's think about access, let's think about how our programs are being um, implemented? Are there crossovers in the programs? What should we be looking at? So we held a, a meeting last week or two weeks ago in Panama about the excessive intakes of micronutrients and this was a big topic. Both representatives of Guatemala and Zambia were there. And the, it was a really great discussion. It's just about, let's think about our programs. What are, what's the aim of our programs? Is it, really, is it being achieved? And uh, do we need to rethink this? What are the costs involved? Would those costs be better spent elsewhere. And so I, I just really appreciate the dialogue of getting this together and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. So I don't have many answers for you. We're working on a lot of those answers and it'll take some time, but I'm happy to hear everybody talking about it and, and bringing it to the forefront. Thank you, Lisa. A good comment. Um, what I'm going to do now is open it up to, to, the, to the audience. Um, if you have a particular question, please address it.